Okay. I'm uh, Troy Topnik. I'm a senior product manager at SUSE, and uh, I'm responsible for cloud application platform. Uh, we just had some news here. They're releasing version 1.1 of our Cloud Foundry distribution. And uh, Stratos UI is a very important part of that distribution, and it's an important part that has uh, become uh, an upstream incubated project, and we're quite proud of it. I'm not the ideal person to be presenting this because I'm not actually the, the dev lead who I want to give total credit to, uh, a guy by the name of Neil McDougall, who's head of our wonderful uh, Stratos UI team in Bristol, UK. And I just want to make sure that they get all the credit for this. He prepared these slides for me to walk us all through uh, the work, the very hard work they've done and the excellent work they've done on making uh, a great open source UI for the Cloud Foundry community. And uh, to that end, he was the one who presented at Basel uh, the unveiling of Stratus UI and the, the ask of the community that could it be accepted for incubation. So um, he, he gave a demo in Basel, and uh, we uh, submitted it for incubation uh, uh, in December of last year. It was quickly accepted and uh, it moved from the SUSE GitHub org into the Cloud Foundry Extensions GitHub org, and now we just call it Stratos. That's the project name. And so uh, for those of you who haven't seen it before, we'll, we'll leave a little bit of a time for a demo, but I think a lot of people saw it, uh, the demo I, I made uh, yesterday uh, in the keynote. So we'll, we'll try and leave some room for questions. And again, I'm not Neil McDougall, so I won't be able to answer the most technical questions about this. Uh, but I'll, I'll do my best, and we can defer some of the other ones to the uh, Stratos channel in the, in the Cloud Foundry Slack. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Stratos is, what it's, what it's meant to do, some of the key features in it, um, how to get it running. And that's, it's actually very easy to do. So we'll talk about the ways you can do that. Um, the uh, team's been very hard at work moving uh, to version 2.0, which is based on Angular 2.0, and uh, I'll give you an idea where we're going with it uh, in, in the near term. Look at the architecture. Uh, if, if it looks like there's going to be time, we'll do uh, a bit more of a demo. We can do it a little bit interactively. We can maybe look at things that people here have a particular interest in. So. I'm going to actually read this one. Stratos provides an easy-to-use web-based UI that allows developers and administrators to manage their applications and Cloud Foundry deployments. Interesting uh, use of the bracket S here, and it's something that some users of Stratos don't notice if they're CF pushing it uh, to Cloud Foundry because you can actually set it up with multiple endpoints. That's one of the key design considerations at the root of Stratos that uh, we're glad we made. Um, so. Uh, it's open source, CF extensions project, very actively developed now, and we're getting uh, more contributors all the time to this project. Um, we have two audiences for this UI, both the developer and the CF admin. Uh, they, uh, obviously, there's going to be a lot more developers on any given Cloud Foundry system, but the admin is a very important person who also needs tools and, uh, and uh, to get the parts of the API exposed that he or she can use. We've made it very easy to deploy uh, and uh, supports, uh, as we said, multiple endpoints. Uses uh, UAA for authentication. Uh, right now, it actually fronts that with a Stratos uh, interface, but we're going to make a change there. Um, uh, endpoint management, not only uh, Cloud Foundry API endpoints, but other kinds of endpoints as well. Uh, we have an application view. Uh, both in a grid and a list, um, uh, the ability to create applications, deploy applications from the, right from the interface, and uh, what we call the Cloud Foundry view, which is an administrative uh, view of a particular foundry and some of the uh, switches that are available to administrators, people who log in with administrative credentials. This is where you go to find it. Uh, as I mentioned, the Cloud Foundry incubator and uh, the stuff that I will be talking about today is in a branch called V2 Master, the, the newest version of it. Um, and you can check it out and push it, but bear in mind, Angular has this funny memory leak, so you might need a lot of memory in your, uh, 
uh, on CF to, to actually uh, complete that push. Uh, but it can also be deployed, uh, as we do it in the cloud application platform, via a Kubernetes chart. So uh, there's, there's that way. That's for deploying natively to Kubernetes. You can run it as a single Docker container. You can build it right from the repo uh, and then run it uh, uh, in Docker. Or you can deploy the Bosch release. So if you're using a Bosch-based Cloud Foundry distribution, which, which most people will be, um, you can use, it, uh, use the Bosch release we made. So as I mentioned, we, um, uh, it was accepted to CF extensions. Uh, we've got uh, an open Slack channel now uh, for Stratos, and that's uh, growing. I see people joining it uh, more and more today. Uh, after yesterday's demo, a couple people joined, a couple more today. Uh, some discussions going on there. Um, uh, uh, version 1.0 was released along with 1.0 of Cloud Application Platform. Um, these versions are not tied together in any way. This is a separate project, and so its version is going to increment uh, as it needs to. We felt it was smart to increment to 2.0 because it was moving to, uh, to AngularJS from Angular 1 to Angular 2. Uh, and yeah, this is what a key thing about uh, 2.0. Uh, the other, the, the word I was searching for in yesterday's uh, keynote demo, which I could not remember, was Google's material design. And this is some set of design principles which were adopted, changed where things were positioned on the page, changed how they were grouped. There's uh, some, uh, some detail on that a little bit later. Um, UI improvements. Um, uh, services support got bumped up a level so that uh, people know, knew, could more easily discover that and find where to, uh, where to manage their services. And we added the uh, ability to connect to a metrics backend uh, to uh, reflect uh, a history of the, uh, of the performance of that application. So I'm not a huge fan of AngularJS, <laughs> but uh, there's, there's some history here that we, uh, we started on AngularJS a long time ago. This, a lot, some of this uh, code originated from the uh, st uh, Staccato 4 uh, code base at HPE. And um, uh, <laughs> there was a, lo a lot of concern even at that time that there was going to be an end of life for Angular 1. For, uh, and so we made it a priority as soon as we were out the door with our uh, Stratus UI that we wanted to get on, on uh, Angular 2 as quickly as possible because then we'd have a clearer migration path to subsequent versions of Ang Angular, which are improving with each release. So um, we wanted to have something that would have legs going forward and that also more people would care about uh, and want to help us develop on. Uh, we, in the midst of that, we got some nice performance improvements of the interface itself, and it allowed us to, to do some other refactoring. Uh, the team uh, started using uh, TypeScript and observables, uh, which uh, allowed us to do some things in a more elegant way than we could with, with the previous version of the code. So there was a lot of benefits for us to making that move now uh, before we start getting uh, a lot more people working on the code base. Uh, one thing that is the most visually noticeable thing is, is the adoption of material design. Uh, it, it makes it uh, uh, a more easily recognizable uh, interface in, in its default. Like, this is all skinnable, right? You can actually uh, make it look uh, however you like. You can brand it. Uh, but uh, the, the base that we work from is nice and simple, extremely clean. Uh, and it's a lot of projects using. It's not just uh, Google. You, you might recognize it more from using Google interfaces, but there's a lot of projects that are adopting this as well. Um, there are some good libraries for it uh, in Angular, and we're starting to use those as well. So what that looks like is this. Uh, so the change looks like this, because this is the old one. Uh, this was... Um, the, this is the, the theming for the open source version as a V1, and here it is now. Um, the groupings are a little better. Uh, we've got a little bit more visual uh, indication of uh, the state of certain things. And uh, yeah, easier to locate the things that are important, grouped logically uh, as per the design uh, manifesto. In the instances view, uh, we've uh, 
we've moved some things into separate tabs that uh, previously weren't. Um, we have, uh, yeah, we've got these wonderful little uh, color cues in uh, each of those panels that uh, give us a little bit of information on the status of that card. And breadcrumbs were huge. I know this was very important to Neil, so that it was clear where you were in the interface and how you could navigate. And um, it keeps the context of how you got there, because there is uh, more than one way into some parts of the UI. We wanted to make sure that when you clicked back, you knew where you came from. And it was just a, 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 nice, a nicety that we could do with Angular now by keeping track uh, of that information. So um, one of the new tabs that I showed in the demo uh, was the GitHub tab. So we, with 1.0, we had the ability to deploy an application directly from GitHub. It uh, searches the project. and actually used the, the GitHub API to pull in some, uh, some information about the project that you were deploying. So you could, uh, you could see that right in the interface. Um, now we can track that uh, after the, uh, the application's been deployed so that we can take further action. And what I talked about in the demo earlier was that you can redeploy when, when changes happen. Um, something that was uh, important to uh, some external contributors we had for, from Orange was that uh, we wanted services to be more visible. So something that was really discoverable only through the applications view previously is now uh, a first class uh, uh, citizen of the left nav. This, uh, this doesn't show very much when we're, uh, when we're looking at a, the limited set that we've got here on the screen, but this uh, fills up very rapidly when you're, when you're connecting it to Blue Mix or, or, or one of these other systems with lots and lots and lots of services there. And uh, what is not quite there yet is the ability uh, in the interface as you had in version one uh, to actually launch and bind services right from the interface. It's coming very soon, um, and, uh, and we're getting some help with that from external contributors as well. Metrics is new. I mean, it's not new, but uh, it's new to the interface. Uh, uh, Neil developed this uh, method of attaching a Prometheus database as an endpoint to Stratos that can uh, capture the metrics that are uh, taken from, from the fire hose and expose them in this view. So we get, uh, we get over time, the detail of the application. So mostly done. Uh, we wanna get feature parity with version one. It's very, very close. Uh, there is only a few things. I've only actually been playing with this version for about a week now. And uh, so sometimes in the demo, I was like looking for a feature that uh, I was expecting to be there. There was only a couple uh, that were missing, and I don't anticipate it'll be very long before we have all that we had in, in, uh, in V1, plus the new things. And it's the, yeah, it's the V2 uh, master branch of the, for the, to look at the Angular 2 code. So what's in the near term? Finish that work, uh, the migration to Angular 2, so that we've got feature parity. Um, uh, we've got uh, some detail in our roadmap on what we want to show in the service catalog, uh, the service instances, keys, the JSON schema support uh, for, for binding and, and creating um, uh, instances, uh, some more metrics work, and uh, the important one here, uh, if you saw my login screen uh, from yesterday, it actually, it's a Stratos UI login. Um, we had a very astute request to actually just use the UAA login page so that whatever authentication mechanisms are enabled with your particular UAA are then exposed in that page. So the, the prime one being uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, UAA can handle that if you've set up the back end correctly, so we want to make sure that, that people with that setup can, can use that, so uh, supporting uh, UAA login directly. And uh, we uh, can deploy from GitHub um, and public uh, Git URLs, uh, arbitrary GitHub uh, Git URLs, but we, uh, we haven't been able to deploy from private Git repos, so we're gonna add that ability as well. So the high-level architecture in here, I'm gonna get really close to my screen because I, um, 
uh, this is uh, probably important to some of you who, are, who work on UIs and have worked with the Cloud Foundry API. Um, we decided initially when we, we started working with this that we didn't want to build a UI, and this, this is going back to the history of the, the interface, that the, the smart way to build it and the most portable way to build it was to focus only on the UI. We would not require the interface to have any other special connection to like the CC database, and that was our um, self-imposed uh, restriction. By doing that, we've got something that can be used with any Cloud Foundry uh, distribution, certified or even otherwise, as long as the API is compat, as long as you, there's full API compatibility. Um, uh, so we've got uh, a single page web application <laughs> in Angular and this very important API server backend, which acts as a sort of proxy to the different components and the different APIs that it has to talk to. Uh, and then uh, an, a, a, a database that uh, stores some state information for the application. And that, by default, when you just CF push it, is going to put it in a, 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 a SQLite database. But you can hook it up alternatively to uh, MySQL or PostgreSQL. Um, I can't remember which one the, uh, the Helm chart uses by default. Um, so the API server actually provides its own uh, REST API for managing the endpoints. Um, and the endpoint store, um, I'll just read it to you here, one or more endpoints uh, can, can handle one or more endpoints, and it manages the uh, tokens for those endpoints. So when you log in through UAA, you are presented with an interface that shows you all of the uh, endpoints that you're connected to. The administrator will configure which endpoints are available. You then log into the endpoints with your own credentials. So in those endpoints, you will see whatever permissions uh, you've been granted in that particular endpoint. This is what we saw yesterday. Um, some things to call out. Um, when you want to deploy an application, You'll see these two buttons. We need your feedback as to whether this button is a good idea. There are two. I can't guess which, which one to use as a new user. This one adds an application. This is a totally legitimate thing to do when you're designing based on the API. Um, this is the Cloud Foundry API call that uh, adds an application. Does anyone know what adding an application does? It doesn't deploy it. It actually just puts a little placeholder in the Cloud Foundry, in the Foundry for the application to go. So we can, uh, it's basically going to be empty. Um, give it a name. It, it does give it a route. So that's all it does. Um, in order of importance of things you would do as a developer, this one right next to it is much more important. So uh, I've had a lot of people go, well, I, I tried to deploy an application. I can't, I, you know, it just created this empty thing. Well, that's actually, this is actually the one you want. Um, so we need to make some decisions about uh, uh, how exactly we want to, to make that differentiated. A little, a little mouse over might help. This is uh, basically what I showed yesterday, and I'll show it maybe with the same, um, maybe a new one called Dizzy Lizard. Uh, yeah. So this is a, just a Node.js application. Um, and uh, we, what, what this doesn't have, which was going to come really soon, is something from the older uh, interface. If we want to deploy an application, we can actually deploy it from a local, local file system. So that'll come to this interface as well. This is using uh, WebSockets to, uh, to get the logging information, uh, the, the stream of the staging process. And while this is happening here, it is also happening here. So even before we have any, anything else meaningful in that interface, we can monitor it here. And of course, uh, as an administrator, 
you will see some of this information, you can see some of this information amongst the many, many things going by in the fire hose. I think if we uh, limited it to, to just the apps, we might actually see some of those staging things happening at a high level. Seems to be done already. So, oh, which one was it? This one. Um, the instances, another nice little touch that was added in this version is the ability to uh, scale up and down with these little buttons. Um, and this is a really fun little app that we made for Suzicon, where you get to basically do Flappy Bird. Oh well, and I'm really, really bad at that game, so we'll skip right out of that. Um, the new uh, GitHub uh, tab with some of that information. Uh, metrics via this metrics endpoint. If we wanted to take a look at more at what this was tracking, we can go look at the uh, Prometheus interface itself and get a completely random graph on <laughs> something that is just basically a straight line. But this is, uh, this is the back end that is going to provide us with the ability to, um, to track the metrics that we care about in Cloud Foundry, both for applications and, and eventually, as we build it out, more for the Cloud Foundry administrator. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the admin view is, should be uh, different. I think I noticed a couple of uh, interesting bugs that we got to maybe work on. Uh, that a regular user should have a very limited view of what they can do with a particular endpoint. Um, I obviously can't make any administrative changes to, uh, uh, to uh, Bluemix, and I probably shouldn't be able to see the Firehose with just a demo account. So I can't, and nothing actually uh, is exposed that shouldn't be, but, uh, but uh, typically in the interface we hide the things that uh, an unprivileged user shouldn't be able to uh, modify. That's basically all I had, but I'd love to open it up for questions if anyone has some questions in the remaining time. Oh, sure. Thanks very much. Yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, can we set up alerts uh, for the metrics? No, uh, but that's a great idea. So if you, uh, a part of the thing, this is a segue. I remember, I do have two more slides. Um, we do want people to, to get involved in this, and uh, uh, we'd love to encourage more contribution. And the way you would uh, ask for that is to go to the GitHub repo and uh, add a feature request in, in GitHub issues. And uh, that's the way we're driving the project now, all in the open. And uh, so we're getting a lot of great ideas coming in just from talking to people here at the conference. And so um, the ability to do that would be a great idea. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your vision for your service catalog, kind of how you see that playing out. Oh, um, is Guillaume here? <laughs> So uh, the service catalog is driven just, it, it's basically an exposing the marketplace uh, view that you would get with the CF CLI. So, um, I mean, this is about, this presentation is about Stratus. I have lots of opinions on what a marketplace <coughs> should evolve uh, for, should evolve into for uh, SUSE Cloud Foundry and for SUSE Cloud Application Platform. But um, basically the goal is for the near term to install to expose all of the parts of the CF API that are relevant to, um, to a Cloud Foundry administrator. So um, uh, there are some interesting uh, proposals on actually hooking this up to, uh, for, for us it's very interesting to maybe put an endpoint on there for, for Helm repositories so that you can actually deploy things to Helm and actually connect it in a backend to, to Kubernetes. But um, uh, for the Cloud Foundry uh, marketplace view, the, the service catalog, we're just following the API there and exposing all the features that we can. So the administrator will eventually be able to add things to the service catalog and uh, perhaps configure service brokers uh, from that part of the view as well. 
can uh, you show a little bit more about what's visible from an administrator's perspective in terms of trying to um, help out people who need support? Sorry, uh, say that again? Oh, just the administ administrator's view of, through Stratos, of everything that's happening in a, in a foundry. Okay. So, uh, and, and I know there's some things, these are some of the things that are not at uh, V1 parity. So uh, we can see the organization view. And uh, we can see what's been deployed to that organization, how many spaces. Now, ideally, we would want to be able to add spaces, which we can. And uh, we can even go back, uh, we can go back one and add an org. So that's something, uh, that is actually something that a regular user might have the ability to do. For example, add spaces to an org um, if they've been given that permission. And that permission would be exposed here. Uh, in the users, we can tell if somebody's a, a manager of the dev, uh, of whatever space they're in, or a manager of an org. And uh, some of the ability for users to do things within their space in their org is managed by feature flags. Now, we made a deliberate choice not to make these toggleable in the UI because some of them are, you know, things that can really change the behavior uh, of Cloud Foundry. So we thought it's like, for example, well, exactly that one, user org creation. You could go, oh, what's that? Toggle. Um, if you make that too easy, people might do that without fully understanding that you're giving the end users uh, the, the power to create their own organizations, which you might want to do, but you know, being, having to go in and do that from the CLI is, uh, is, is, was advisable as a first step. So we might make these toggleable. We'll have to discuss with people uh, if that's a good idea, but for now, that's, uh, that's what we've, we've done. Um, we in this version, uh, can see which build packs are available on the system. Uh, we don't have the ability to reorder them at the moment uh, or to add build packs or, or replace them. These are, again, things that uh, you have to go back to the CLI to do and might be best kept there. So uh, administrators who are looking after Cloud Foundry system probably are going to be familiar with these commands to um, to move build packs, to add new build packs. And they're probably not operations that are going to happen very often. So we've, we've sort of haven't totally kept them out of consideration, but they're, they're certainly low priority. Um, the, the stacks, uh, same sort of thing. Install, uh, adding a new stack is going to be a, you know, a complex operation. And changing a security group, I think there's um, perhaps a better case for, for making an interface for this for, for changing security groups because uh, in this, at the CLI, you're actually operating with uh, either YAML or JSON and you have to go look up the docs and see what, uh, see what you have to do to enable a particular route to a new service that you've added or you know, there needs to be some new special rule. Um, so. So yeah, we're, we're going to have to, as we go, make design decisions about how much we want to enable the administrator through this interface versus um, just punting them to the command line to actually make changes and making this more of a, a, a viewing mechanism. Did that answer the question, or did you have more uh, thoughts about the metrics side for diagnosing things? And That's great. Thanks. We'll okay. Uh, one of my favorite things in the Firehose view in the, the, uh, the V1 version, uh, which is going to come soon enough, was the ability in the Firehose to, um, to filter based on substring. So this is, uh, you know, can get to be a lot of information, but you see something go by, you can quickly... Uh, I, you know, isolate those uh, those using a substring matrix or or use a regex. So, uh, we're going to see that back in as well, uh, as well as the the checkbox filters. Uh, as an administrator, can I 
manage multiple foundations together. Like, for example, if I, if I have an active active in my environment, two foundations, um, and I want to add the same set of orgs in both, can I do them together, or do I have to individually go and add them to each of the endpoints? Oh, so you've got multiple foundries, and you want to uh, recreate the same structure within each of those foundries. Yeah. There's no way in the UI to do that. Um, obviously, uh, in the endpoints view that I showed, um, I, I only have administrative access to one of these. But if I did have admin access, I would see the admin tools for each. Um, and because of the breadcrumbs, you'd always know which foundation you were on, uh, I think. Uh, so, so that would be clear. Uh, in terms of automatically creating that structure within each foundation, you could use our new um, back and, backup and restore CLI tool, uh, which actually can back up um, an entire uh, foundation and move it to a new one just using the API. Okay. If you've got administrative credentials, you can actually back up the, even, even the applications and, and put them to a new, a new uh, foundation. OK. All right. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question to that. Uh, so you mentioned backup and restore. Are you using BBR to do that? What, what yes. are you use? We're okay. using exclusively the API. And this is not to be confused with Bosch backup and restore, mm -hmm. which does things behind the scenes. This is a backup and restore strategy that goes in the other side and uh, just exercises the API. Okay. We're firm believers in operating CF that way via the APIs that are exposed. So. Okay. Thank you. And uh, an idea came to me this morning that uh, a couple of people agreed with on the, on the Slack channel was uh, the idea of what would be really nice here is if uh, each of these uh, foundries was visually identified with an with a identicon or a something or you know, a, a user configurable or an admin configurable icon so that they instantly know when you're looking at the application's aggregated view, ah, this one is on, for example, this is, how do I tell which Dizzy Lizard is where without clicking through at the moment. This one's on IBM Cloud versus this one's on the one that I just dis deployed. So uh, little visual hints as to which uh, organization in space even and, and which foundry they're on. Sorry. Earlier, you were showing the uh, Dizzy Lizard app, and, and there was a, an image. This, OK. So this what, one um, was pulled from the uh, GitHub API, because that's my face on GitHub. And uh, when we were actually deploying it, uh, let's see this again. So that's just your GitHub profile? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, uh, in a previous version of this, in an old, sorry, an, an old version of, of the UI that we worked on, we actually had Gravatar support for the users, so that when a user logged in with an email address, it would check and see if there was a Gravatar enabled for that, and they would actually have their picture on it as well. So you could see in the timeline who had deployed what, so it was really useful. I just want to make sure um, that I don't forget to uh, show um, that we are, um, we want to, we're here to get uh, your feedback. Uh, we want to get your pull requests and your enhancement requests, uh, and we want you to join us on the, the Stratos Slack channel. And this is where you find it. Thanks very much for your time today. Thanks for bearing with me with the AV issues. <laughs> <laughs>